Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. I'm here with my old friend Jeremy, who is the founder of Bloomberg's Alt Data Division. Brilliant mind in the field of alt data. Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, hey, look, my pleasure, Alex. I enjoyed it last time, and I'm grateful to have a chance to take another whack at it. Oh, our, our pleasure. We always love to learn from you. So what is going on today in the field of alt data? I saw that there's a company that ran into some trouble this week. Do you want to give our viewers some background on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I was delighted to uh, spend a few days at Salt and Battlefin and talking to everybody and got a really good, fresh perspective uh, on- Tim Harrington's my boy. I loved him. Tim and Todd are great. So I'm an advisor at Battlefin and uh, Scaramucci's involved uh, now in Battlefin. So I think we're going to have some great events there. So awesome. staying on the pulse of what's happening this week was really top of mind for me. And then uh, I think the Scaramucci one that, was actually a trader for my mother's hedge fund like 30 years ago. <laughs> the Long Island yeah. Mafia, right? Ugh, it's, uh, well, back, uh, back, back, you know, when he was a kid, you know, 22, 23. Uh, that's great. Uh, um, was, um, but anyway, tell us about this. Uh, this yeah, so, so, so the uh, thing that was sort of top of mind on Wednesday that dropped uh, something that I think we were all kind of mindful of and watching for, uh, but came into effect. Uh, App Annie is probably one of the leaders, if not the leader in uh, app intelligence uh, for you know, hedge funds and frankly, corporates as well. I don't know if you know how a lot of these app providers uh, of data get all their app information, but no idea. essentially- you think about it as sort of a give get typically where, um, you know, popular apps plug into a platform, they can see the benchmarking and analytics across Google play and Apple iTunes, and it helps provide some demonstration of success, whether that's login, you know, how many user activity they have, how many downloads, logins and stuff like that. So it's sort of deep information on apps. A lot of hedge funds rely on it for anything from looking at how many people are on the Lululemon lemon app on a daily basis or are people doing the Tinder, you know, premium subscription or not like mm -hmm. very popular data set. So wow, App that's Annie, very valuable. Yeah. Yes. I can see. Yeah. So app Annie sensor tower, Aptopia, there's, you know, several names in the industry. The one that's the most longstanding, the one that's probably the most well-known is app Annie and um, app Annie's CEO uh, was actually let go by the board, I think in 2018. And uh, the sec came out with the hammer on Wednesday. They have fined app Annie $10 million um, for essentially breaching um, a layer of confidence um, with their users. Um, they were taking data from each of the apps and taking real private data from all the users of the apps, aggregating that and selling the benchmarks and forecasts and analytics uh, to, to hedge funds. And what they were doing was in order to try to stay synthetic or to stay out of um, public non-material information, mm -hmm. what they were supposed to be doing was just kind of creating an analytics layer that is an estimator and it gets smarter with the training data, but it's not truly passing private data. Well, you know, as you can imagine, they were actually shaping the data using real data. And uh, they did that for four years and the SEC investigated and, you know, they established this complaint. So, I mean, I think the reason it's really topical is I know from the whole buyer process, the vendor process that due diligence on behalf of really anybody involved in the chain um, is, is critical. You know, if you're trying to sell to a hedge fund and you're a first time vendor, you really have to be cautious and spend a lot of time on the legal compliance layer. And I know funds are really keen to protect that. So I, I think this was kind of a shot across the bow, um, you know, but, but having said that, I mean, every, every industry has its challenges. Um, you know, banks get fined every day. Hedge funds have had no contest, significant fines. I think this was the first real fine that we've seen in the space. And it's enough to, you know, keep on people's minds and keep the rigor in place. I don't know that there's going to be long-term sustainable damage, but it, it was, look, it was a big, it was a big discussion this week for sure. Privacy of data is very important and definitely the forefront of everyone's minds, you know, with, you know, legislation that seems to be growing and growing uh, everywhere. So, got, you know, there's, I, I hate to plug all of my companies, so forgive me, I've do. got do dozens no, that I do. in invest and advise in, but one company I've been advising for some time is called Triple Blind. And what Triple Blind does is instead of using this classic homomorphic encryption or something to mask data, they've actually created a process where you can synthesize and use data wherever it sits without actually passing it and encrypting it. So really popular with healthcare data, increasingly popular in financial services, you know, banks and KYC. So triple, triple blind is, is, is super interesting because when you think about aggregation and anonymization and encryption, these all have 
hack points or risk points. So if you're able to compute wherever the data sits without passing anything, there's no PII or issues at all. Um, anyway, so plug for Triple Blind, uh, backed by Mayo Ventures and uh, Next Gen, where I'm an investor. Um, really, really cool company. Oh, no, very. That is very cool. So do you see new technologies coming into the data space right now? I mean, everyone thinks of satellite data, you know, anything that's been exciting for you recently? Yeah, a bunch of different topics. Uh, the one that you and I were discussing before this, uh, I think ESG um, is, is just so incredibly critical right now. Um, if you look at the landscape of ESG data, you've got some of the big players like MSCI and Morningstar Sustainalytics, um, you know, the, some of the bigger players that are direct sellers. They, they have created a pretty rigorous standard and they have created benchmarks and factors that are critical to most processes. But I like some of the new the new players coming up. You know, Clarity has raised like $100 million and they seem to be doing pretty well. One company that I onboarded- at What Bloomberg, does Clarity do? Yeah, so, so if you think about the layers of what is the E, the S, and the G, what companies like Clarity and the one I, I, I particularly like, Owl, uh, that I onboarded at Bloomberg, what they do is they try to create um, a layer of features around all of the rules and regulatory for each country. There's a few different oversight bodies for society and governance, in particular in Western Europe. Uh, SFR and a few other regulatory bodies are making sure that companies are ESG compliant within a certain time frame. The, the S and the G are a little easier to calculate because they tend to be, you know, what is the board composition? Um, the E is one of the harder areas because when you say E is that carbon neutral is that no use of, you know, titanium or nickel, or I don't know, some, some damaging metal uh, in a process. Uh, so the E and the S and G are all a series of features and they, they can be graded. So from a quantitative perspective, companies like Al and Clarity AI try to benchmark and look at thousands of equities and securities to see what that exposure is and to assign a ranking. It's almost like a, a Morningstar bond rating uh, in that perspective. Um, so I think ESG has been you know, super hot topic and private equity funds, hedge funds, and others have in the past looked at it as an exclusion list. You know, If something is sort of not ESG compliant, they just exclude it from an index or a benchmark. I think you're seeing more calculus and rigor now around less of let's exclude something and more of I want to understand the depth and breadth of ESG compliance and or you know, how good of an actor are they? Um, and then, you know, some, at some point I can see hedge funds or activists agitating in a way to, to get people more ESG compliant. So I think having the scores and mechanism in place for benchmarking this stuff is, it's, it's super hot. Do you think companies are trying to pad their financial statements to make them seem more ESG compliant with ESG positive words? It's funny that you say that, and you probably saw the uh, the greenwashing uh, situation. So when you falsely give the impression or mislead that you are environmentally sound, if you take it too far, of course, uh, <laughs> you're you're subject to uh, to some pretty nasty fines. I think it was uh, Deutsche Bank recently just got in trouble for what they call greenwashing and representing a fund as you know ESG compliant, and yet it's not. Um, so yeah, I think greenwashing has become a pretty pretty nasty nasty thing that people are people are looking at, you know, like you obviously can't misrepresent um, that you're ESG compliant. So greenwashing is something that's becoming more and more, um, you know, on people's minds. And are there any data uh, areas you think that are kind of falling out of favor? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the areas that's been tough, I think is credit card data. I mean, people love to rely on transactions and I'm not saying credit card data is going away, but when you take a population or a survey of credit cards and uh, some banks are sort of deciding that they don't necessarily want to participate, um, you know, Yodley Investnet is, is probably the most well-known um, credit card data set, but some of the banks are withdrawing some of their credit cards from that and they'd rather not take a chance on selling their downstream analytics and pulling that out. So uh, credit cards, super important. Is that an ethic? That's an ethics decision? Ethics and... Um, yeah, I think also, you know, retailers don't necessarily want um, all this data in the hands of users. And, and maybe that comes back to MNPI also. Yeah. Um, if you can prove that having app data that's, you know, shaped or not shaped is, uh, is an issue, why wouldn't credit cards at scale also be an issue? So I do, I, I would think that there's pressure to, uh, to remove bank data and credit card transactions data from some of these data sets. So still really popular, but definitely an area of risk. I think the other area is, um, you know, surveys. Uh, I think you've got a lot of survey data and uh, other 
pulled data that is, is very valuable, but it's also a little bit dangerous. Um, yeah, I, I think there's really good actors in the space, though. Similar web just went public. Israeli, company. they aggregate a lot of uh, tech and tech and app usage, both on desktop and uh, on mobile, to help people understand these companies. Um, they've got interesting search characteristics. Um, one of the companies I advise uses Similar Web to see what are the hot brands in e-commerce and try to actually market to those hot e-commerce brands for lending and other services. So, um, you know, you're always going to have popularity around web crawling, um, but all of these, you know, have to be done the right way. And last question has to do with 5G. Do you see any types of new data coming out because of 5G? Yeah, I think if you look at, um, particularly with this whole stay at home thing or whatever we're doing in COVID day to day, I think seeing the uh, the usage patterns and the telecom patterns as it relates to industrial tech, the phone carriers, all the high tech, uh, you know, the, the chips, the chip usage, cloud usage, quant computing usage, there's some really clever ways to see who's, you know, who's using that bandwidth and who's not. So uh, I think you are seeing some more crispness, crispness and uh, quality quality stuff there. Awesome. Well, uh, this was a really fun show. Last question, last question. Do you see the U.S. economy continuing to be strong or are you a little bearish or do you have no opinion? I'm pretty bullish. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a macro caller, but everything I see in New York and every, <laughs> every flight I'm on is full. I went to a Mets game Wednesday. A lot of people were there. I have a feeling that we're all so pent up that consuming, whether it's experiences or food or, or clothing, there's a lot of pent up de demand for that. And with all the QE and oh. MMT, you know, m money's free, even though money's going to inflate. And at some point our taxes go up, probably. I, I just feel like there's so much uh, money sloshing around the system. You see it in valuations and companies that we invest in. You see it everywhere. So I would say the money train still works. I mean, we, we've called this the top for, for several years, you know, as, as, as people that know macro and know cycles, I saw Ray Dalio speak this week and, you know, we all know that there's a, a wrecking ball coming and cash is trash, quote unquote. Um, but when is that going to happen? So far, I see lots of green shoots this fall. We've got a lot of foot traffic and people having fun and spending money. Um, so I don't know if it's the uh, roaring twenties, but I, I'd say macro is still looking good, at least for now. Awesome. Well, you have a wonderful week in Germany and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it.